I'll be reading from Luke 9, 37 through 45. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It rarely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked him and the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. While everyone was marveling at him, at what Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Listen carefully to what I am about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands, <coughs> hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. I was asked to say that. We've had, uh, because of our president's situation, COVID is even more in the news than it was before. And people are maybe more knowledgeable or concerned about the disease than they were before because of the, the extra press that comes along with that. We need to pray for him and for others who have that. The Bible says we're supposed to honor and pray for the king, and, and I assume that means presidents too. But uh, well, we should do that. I don't know if you've looked at any of the statistics lately, but with 7 million COVID cases in the United States, you know what that means? Let's, let's break this down into something that's easier for us to understand maybe. The average person in the United States has 600 friends and acquaintances, 600. That's the average person. Some of us that are out here are far above average. Judd probably has somewhere around 6 million. But, the, but most of us have about 600. That means that if you are average, you know 17 people who have COVID. 17 people. We don't think about that often. You know, uh, we don't think about it. We didn't think about it very seriously in our family necessarily until we found out that Gail's nephew has COVID. And he did everything he was supposed to do, and now his wife has COVID. And, uh, and they've got a little bitty baby, and, and we're concerned about the baby, and we're concerned about them. He's not doing real well with it right now. He's struggling with it. He's a young man. And they said only old people would be affected by it. But no, people get it in all age groups. And if you've got underlying conditions, you can be in danger. So we ask you again, and we encourage each other to let's watch out for each other. Let's protect each other the best we can. We don't want this disease to be the cause of the end of any of us or to be the cause of grief for any of us. We, uh, last Friday night, made the drive to Pea Ridge, Alan and I did, and, and we had a blast. We, uh, we had a blast going up there, and one of the things that we saw that, that I thought was funny, I don't know if anybody else that saw it thought it was funny, but I thought it was hilarious, and, and most of the ones that were involved were laughing, so I think they thought it was funny, but. Larry Miller was, was giving Charles Session a rather difficult time. Larry was up there doing the filming for the ball game for the TV station, and, and, and Charles Session was sitting over there, and, and he was kind of giving Larry a hard time back. And, and what happened was at halftime, the band came out, and they lined up, and they were waiting apparently for the announcer to say what all they were going to do. So the band was just standing there on the field. They weren't playing or anything. They were just standing there. They were all in their position. Nobody was moving. And it was total silence. And Larry Miller looks over at Charles Session. He says, it looks like a Church of Christ worship service. <laughs> and he said, nobody's playing their instruments at all. And Charles said, yeah, and if you'll notice, nobody's dancing either. <laughs> I thought it was funny. I did. You know, some people in the world think that's the way we are, that we just kind of sit around and don't do anything. They don't realize that as we come together, when we lift up our hearts to God, it comes from the heart, and we worship God with all our heart. I love our singing. That's why I asked for an extra song. I love it when we come together to praise God. 
How great is that, that we get to be a part of that. This particular lesson today, I, I'm calling it a boy is healed. I don't know. It's, that's just what the little paragraph title in my Bible had it. So I, I just kind of plagiarized it from that. But I guess it's not plagiarism if I say that's where I got the title from. Uh, anyhow, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. The reading was kind of interesting. But Matthew and Mark both go a little more in depth on this particular story. So I want to read from Matthew and Mark. So if you've got your Bibles handy, go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17, Matthew records this same incident here in Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> and there it says, Jesus heals a boy with a demon. So that would have been a, probably a better sermon title if I'd have just taken it from that heading. But it says, reading from the English Standard Version, he says, and when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, kneeling before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water, and I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Mark records it as follows. By the way, if you want to go to Mark chapter 9, that's just a couple of pages over in my Bible, not far over probably in yours either. Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 14. Now, Mark's the shortest of the Gospels, and yet this account in Mark takes up more space than in Matthew and in Luke combined. It's something that really was important enough to be put into this shortest of Gospels. It says, starting in verse 14, Mark chapter 9, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great, multi or a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he says, what are you arguing about with him? And someone from the crowd said, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled around, or rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, and it's often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can... All things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And some of your translations say prayer and fasting there. You know, sometimes when we're reading through our Bible, if there's an account that's given in two or three different locations, if we'll read the differing accounts, we get a little more depth into what we're reading than if we just read the one account that we're studying in. And so we need to do that sometimes. And we definitely need to be reading our Bibles. One of the things that happened Friday night, I told Alan, I said, that's for a sermon. I had to put it in a sermon. We were leaving Pea Ridge and, and we were following the GPS and we got to uh, Bentonville or somewhere, I think we were at Bentonville, and we came up to, to the interstate there and the uh, GPS told us to turn in a quarter mile onto 49 on the exit to the right. So we're getting close to it. I'm the navigator, Alan's driving. And I said, 
Alan, you need to be in the right lane. She said, turn. Alan said, okay, he gets over in the right lane, and he says, is this it? And I said, that's it right there, see the sign? So we turned on 49 North. It was 2.7 miles to where the interstate ended, and we ended up in a small town there and had to figure out a place to make a U-turn and then come back and follow around a turn around and a swing back in three or four different ways where there were trucks parked in the middle of the road and all kinds of things. And we finally got back on the interstate headed home. Folks, there's a lesson there. Don't just listen to the preacher and take his word for what he tells you. <laughs> turn to an authority. Listen to your GPS. More importantly, listen to the GPS for life. Don't just take the preacher's word for it. Pick up the book and look and see what it says. And when the preacher says the Bible says this, turn to that page in your Bible, turn to that text in your Bible and read it for yourself. Because one of the most wonderful things about our God's revelation to us is that anybody, anybody can pick it up and read it and understand it. You don't have to have a degree in Greek. You don't have to have a degree in, in ancient Hebrew. No, you don't even have to have a Greek in classical literature. No, you just pick up your Bible. It's available, and as Judd's been saying, in, in, in more languages than any other book's ever been translated into. It's available in a language you can understand. And you can pick it up and you can read it for yourself and understand the message of God. And isn't that great? that he gives us that and we don't have to rely on whether or not the preacher's paying proper attention to the road signs. We can read them for ourselves. So what we see here as we look at this, as we get into this, is this earnest plea. I'm, and, and I want to look at this in the text that we're at in, in Luke because we're preaching through Luke as we do this. It says, on the next day when they had come down from the mountain, now, remember what happened. Last week we talked about the transfiguration. Jesus was transfigured on the mountain. The Peter and James and John had seen him there. They had seen the glory of God with him. They had seen Moses and Elijah. They had thought, hey, let's build three tabernacles and we'll just have a, a, a mountaintop worship experience and we'll just stay up here forever and worship God. And that wasn't what it was about. It was about coming home or coming down to the people. But as they come down, the next day when they come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he's my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him and suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. You know, when we were reading Matthew's account in my Bible, in the English Standard Version, it says that he had epilepsy. Uh, most of your translations will say he was possessed by a demon, and, and that's what the, the wording there implies, possessed by a demon. It doesn't say epilepsy. Epilepsy wasn't known at the time the Bible was written. But when you read the description, some modern translator said, that sounds like epilepsy. Let me tell you a secret, just so we can understand it. Whether Jesus cast out a demon, or whether Jesus healed epilepsy with a word, it's still a miracle. You can't deny the miraculous nature of what's going on here. I believe the boy was possessed by a demon because that's what the original text indicates. And so I, I accept, but if someone wants to say, well, my Bible says epilepsy, that's fine. It doesn't deny the miraculous nature of what happens. Only one thing, if the boy was possessed by only epilepsy, why did Jesus have to drive a demon out? That just kind of kind of makes it pretty clear to me, but, but, but we'll move on from that. We, we just don't want to miss, we don't want to miss the obvious there because there are those in the world who say, you've got an inconsistency in your book from God. No, we don't have any inconsistency in our book from God. We have maybe some inconsistencies in translation, but no inconsistencies in our book from God. The father comes to him with this earnest plea. You know, one of my favorite passages is in Mark's account. The father is so distraught as he comes up to Jesus and he says, says, look, this is what's been going on. And he says, 
If you can do anything. I brought him to your disciples and they couldn't do anything. But if you can do anything. And, and it's amazing. And Jesus turns around. He turns it back to him in a question. He says, if I can. If you can do anything. Why did you bring him to me if you don't think he'd, I could help? Now he doesn't actually say the last part of that. But the indications are there in the way he says, if you can, well, why'd you bring him to me if you didn't think I could? Do you not believe? And the father says, oh, I love that. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. That's the way I learned it when I was growing up. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. You know, I've been there. Have you been there? You've been there before? Yes, I believe. But man, my faith is so weak. Yes, I believe, but I'm not sure my faith is adequate for the task that I'm facing at this time. Yes, I believe, but the challenges that I'm facing right now in my life, the difficulties that I see, the hardships that are all around me, the people that are hurting, the pain that's in my own soul are so great, they're so tremendous, that I know there's nothing I can do. And I want to believe you can I want to believe with all my heart that God is still in control. And please help me believe. Ever been there? I have. I've been there before and just, just, just pouring my heart out to God to help me believe. By the way, Paul gives an answer for that. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. If we'll read our Bible and pray every day, if we'll read our Bible and pray every day, if we'll just read our Bible and pray every day, our faith will grow stronger. And then when those challenges come up, and we're sitting there, we're saying, Lord, I, 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 I want to believe so much. I trust with all my heart, but it's, 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 it's like there's some part of me that wonders Maybe we'll remember a prophet all alone in a cave who felt like he was all alone in the world until the Lord passed by, but he wasn't in the whirlwind or the fire. Remember that story? It's there for a purpose. Maybe when it seems so dark that there's no deliverance available, we'll remember Samson with no eyes, blinded, who says, Lord, if you'll just give me strength one more time, one more time, and God answered his prayer. Maybe when we're so dark and we've got no hope and no promise and no answer and our faith is so very weak, we'll remember the story of a little girl who Jesus looked at on her deathbed and says, Talitha kum, little girl, I say to you, get up. And she did. And maybe our faith will be strengthened. But that comes from reading the word. Reading the word over and over and over again. So that when the trials come, when the doubts assail, when the difficulties arise, when we wish our faith was stronger, it is. It is because somebody else has already been through this and God has already proven himself over and over and over again. How wonderful that is. By the way, when we get to the end of it and we find out we win, doesn't matter what the battles are. We're going to win. It doesn't matter what the problems are. We're going to overcome. It doesn't matter what the challenges are. When it's all said and done, God wins and we're on his side. So we win. We need to understand that. And so what we see next is this rebuke. Verses 40 and 41, it's kind of interesting. He says, I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And then Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. You can almost hear anger in Jesus' voice as he says this to them. There's a whole crowd there. A whole multitude. They're waiting to see what's going to happen. Jesus' disciples weren't able to heal him and... and, and in spite of their faith, because of their faithlessness, they're unable to heal the boy. Remember, we've been preaching through Luke. We've been studying through Luke together. We've been looking at the Gospel of Luke as, as it's written. 
It wasn't that long ago we had a whole sermon on Jesus sending the 12 out so that they could go out and they could cast demons out. They could heal every disease. You remember that? If you don't remember it, go back to the beginning of this very chapter we're in. It's not been that long ago. The disciples were able to heal all kinds of people. And now all of a sudden they can't. You know, it's, it's kind of amazing as we look at that. They had experienced real power from on high, but for whatever reason here, they're unable to help this boy. Maybe they had become a little arrogant. Maybe they were kind of like Moses saying, must we bring water out of this rock for you? And, and maybe they were thinking, look at us, we can heal people. Maybe they had become a little arrogant. I have the power to heal people. No, you don't. God has the power to heal people. You know, I hear preachers sometimes say, well, I have the power or the ability to save people. That's my job as a preacher. No, God has the power and the ability to save people. The Word of God has the power to touch their hearts and transform their lives. I get blessed to share it. That's my part. I get to share it. How cool is that? But the disciples, for whatever reason, they couldn't do it. They'd experienced this real power from God. Maybe they thought that just being in the proximity of Jesus would help them, and they'd be able to heal the boy. Remember later on, we're going to see this guy that says, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches about, and the demons are going to beat him. Remember that? He'd heard of it, but he didn't really believe in it. Maybe they thought just because they were in the proximity of Jesus, they would be able to, to, to do this. But whatever their thoughts, they were not the thoughts of God, and they were not thoughts of faith and trust that God could do things. And Jesus attributes it to their lack of faith. That's what Jesus says. They just didn't have enough faith. And we know that because Jesus rebukes them, and, and he didn't pull any punches. You know, when Jesus rebukes somebody, he doesn't say, now, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but. No, Jesus just kind of throws it out there. And he says, this is the way it is. And, and he tries to straighten people out. And he tries to correct people and help people. And, and, and he tells them what they need to hear, whether they want to hear it or not. You know, sometimes I think we get too much sugarcoating in our preaching. We're worried about hurting somebody's feelings. We're worried about being politically correct. We're worried about what is the world going to think or how are you going to bring people to Christ if you're, if you're teaching all these things that are difficult and hard to understand or, or difficult and hard to accomplish because you're talking about changing my life and I don't want to change my life. And so we're worried about doing those kind of things. But later when Paul writes to young Timothy, he says to Timothy, preach the word. What word? The word of God. Preach the word. Be instant. Be constant. In season and out of season. When it's popular and when it's not popular. I had a friend tell me one time, so that means you're supposed to preach, you're not supposed to skip Sunday for deer season because you've got to preach in season and out of season. But anyhow, <laughs> preach the word. When it's popular and when it's not popular. In season and out of season. When people are turning to God after they, like they did after 9-11. People all over the country were turning to God. It was in season. It was a good time to preach the gospel. People wanted to hear it. Or out of season when you have times of prosperity and people would like to just kind of ignore the truth of the gospel because it gets in the way of living their abundant life they want to live. Whatever. But he says, preach the word in season and out of season. And then he says these three words, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all patience and doctrine. Now, when I learned it, it was long-suffering instead of patience. Same difference, same word, same meaning. Patiently teaching the word, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. With doctrine, this is what the word of God says. And with patience, understanding that everybody's not necessarily going to accept it the first time they hear it. They may need to hear it more than one time before they realize this is, in fact, the word of God. And then they can change. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Reprove means to correct them. Oh, you like being corrected? I can remember my daddy saying, boy, get in here. Sit in that chair. Well, I didn't want to do that. I'd have much rather been beat with a stick. But that wasn't the choice. 
that would sit in that chair. And you're about to be corrected. And you're going to be rebuked, too. Rebuke means to tell somebody when they're doing what's wrong. You know, we're supposed to do that. Galatians 6 promises me as a Christian. You know, uh, we always look at it that if someone is overtaken in a fault or if a brother's overtaken in a fault, you who are without sin, go to him and try to correct him, but taking heed to yourself lest you also be tempted. We look at that and we say, okay, that's my job is to go out and look for people that are hurting or people that are doing wrong and to, and to correct them. No, that's my promise from God that when I am in error, some other Christian will come up to me and help me in my life so that I don't lose my soul. See, it's not about me going out and correcting other people as much as it is a promise from God that there's going to be other people that are going to care enough for me to help me along my way and along my journey. And we need that, and, and we understand that a little bit, but that's something we're supposed to do. Exhortation, which is the third one of those words, is just encouraging somebody to turn around and do what's right. Okay, brother, listen, you're doing such and so. You're doing such and so. You know that's not right. God says he'll reward you if you do this and this and this. Why not do what God wants you to do? That's exhortation. The reproving and the rebuking is what you're doing is not right. And we ought to be doing that with each other. But I think we ought to be doing it with our arm around each other. I think we ought to be doing it from a position of love and support and concern for one another. We owe that to each other. Jesus didn't pull any punches, and I don't think we can either. You know, I hear again people say, well, you shouldn't be so harsh when you preach. You know, you say there's only one way to go to heaven, and that's through Jesus, and there's no other possible way, and that anybody who doesn't believe and hasn't been baptized is lost. Well, those are Jesus' words. It's not harsh, and it's not hateful to look at the Word of God and say, this is what the Word of God says. That's not harsh and hateful. What's harsh and hateful is to go to the Word of God and to make it say something like, well, as long as you're happy and you send your check to our church, then you're going to go to heaven. Let's all clap hands and be happy. That's harsh. That's hateful because it doesn't bring people any closer to God. You know, as we look at this, we see in verse 42 that the prayer gets answered. It says, while he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. Oh, I love that. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. You see the horror of the affliction here? You see what's going on? The demon, King James Version, dashed him down and, and, and tore him grievously. The demon threw him to the ground. The demon caused him to fall on the ground and start convulsing there. It's not giving up without a fight. It knows what's going on. It's about to face the power of God. It is coming into the presence of God Almighty, and the demon cannot stand. By the way, Psalm 1, the unrighteous or the wicked will not stand in the presence of God. It threw him down. It's not giving up. And then look at the wonderful power. Jesus rebuked the demon. He rebuked the demon. He healed the boy. Over and over again, as we read through the gospel accounts, we see demons calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You know, I hear people say all the time, well, all you have to do is call on the name of the Lord to be saved. The demons called on the name of the Lord constantly. Constantly. And yet they weren't being saved. They were being expelled. You know, I think we need to understand that. And you say, well, all you got to do is to believe to be saved. You said believe and be baptized a while ago, but all you got to do is just believe to be saved. This demon believed so much he couldn't stand in the presence of Jesus. The other demons believed so much. Jesus, have you come to persecute us before the time? Please don't cast us into what? Let us go into the pigs. Remember we read that. 
The demons knew who he was. They confessed his name. They believed with all their hearts. Matter of fact, James says the demons believe and tremble. They're terrified because they know who he is. No, every time I hear the phrase faith only for salvation, I'm reminded that the only place in the Bible where it says anything about faith only only occurs one time. It's in James chapter 2 and verse 24. It says, you see then that a man is saved by works and not by faith only. We're not saved by faith only. We're saved by the grace of God. Our faith and obedience to his word. That's what saves us. And what we see next is this act of tender compassion by Jesus. He gave him back to his father. He gave him back to his father. You know, we don't think much about that, but Luke records this again a little earlier in Luke chapter 7 when we were reading that story there about the widow of Nain and her son. It says that, that Jesus, well, here's what it says. It says, the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. When Jairus' daughter was raised, Jesus told them, give her something to eat. He brought the families back together. He showed compassion on those who had been healed. It's not the end of the story, just the healing. The end of the story is the restoration. The end of the story is the hope. The end of the story is the promise. The end of the story is the reunification and total and complete wholeness of the individual after everything has happened. And it says people were astonished. They were astonished. They never experienced anything like this before. They've never seen anything like this before. They were amazed at the power. And now listen to what it says. Not of Jesus. They were astonished at the majesty of God. They saw God at work. They saw the power of God coming through Jesus as he did this miracle. And they didn't understand it. But they were amazed. The next little bit there, that next couple of verses. While they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying. And it was concealed from them so they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Jesus knew what was about to happen. Jesus knew he was on the way to Jerusalem and that when he got there, he was going to be put, in, put to death. He was trying to prepare them for it, but they weren't ready for that. They weren't ready for that message. They had just had a mountaintop experience. They had just seen the power of God demonstrated right in front of them and the power of healing this little boy. They weren't ready for Jesus to say, it's, it's about to be over, my ministry on earth. They weren't ready for that. And so he's trying to give them a foreshadowing of what's about to happen because he loved them. You know, many, many years ago, before any of us were born, before any of our grandparents were born, before any of their grandparents were born, before any of their great, great, great grandparents were ever born, all the way back before Adam and before Eve, God looked and said, I'm going to make man, and I know they're going to fail me. But I love them. I love them. And I'm going to love them. And I'm going to love them so much that I'm going to pay the price to bring them back to me and to redeem them. So before history began, God put in place a plan that we see being enacted right here in front of us as we read this text. Jesus living among men, caring and compassionate for their hurts on his way to the cross so that he could die and we could have hope of eternal life. You know, Alan and I had a chance to talk about a bunch of stuff. I mean, when you're making a five hours driving round trip and add 30 minutes to it because the preacher went the wrong way. But uh, when, you're, uh, when you're driving like that, you have plenty of time to talk about things. And, 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 and we do. We talk about all kinds of things. And we talk about all kinds of what all's going on in the world and faith and things like that. 
One of the things that Alan and I can totally and completely agree on every time when we have conversation is that we can trust in what God has told us. And if Jesus has told us, well, we were talking about Francis Chan, so I'll just say that out front. Love to listen to Francis Chan's sermons, and I love the way Francis Chan puts it. If Jesus has told us that we need to be, we need to believe and be baptized in order to be saved, then why wouldn't we do it just simply because he said so? Why wouldn't we do it just simply because he said so? Not because he commanded me to do it, but because he asked me to. Because he's the one who went on the cross for me and for you. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we're going to invite you to come down to the front. We'll pray with you. If you need to respond and become a Christian, we'll talk to you about that. We'll baptize you into Christ, and you can leave here washed clean of all of your sins. If you need to respond, won't you come while we stand and sing to encourage you?